Go ahead. This building that you're looking at behind me is the storeroom for the winery, which I suspect hasn't been used in, well, since the early 1940s, the latest. Wait, hold on. Right okay, go ahead. All right. Um, the building that we're looking at behind me here is was was a, a wine storage building that, that um, probably wasn't used after the 1940s. The winery on the other side of the road, I know, um, wasn't used after Siegfried Beckhold bought this ranch in the early, late 40s and uh, um, took every every one of the prize-winning grapevines out as one of the biggest, biggest tragedies of Fountain Grove. Uh, this was the winery building. There are reminiscences inside of, of uh, what was there, a few wine corks and the building, the, the rooms that were used, and if you can see the look inside it's, at what is falling apart, you can see that the insulation and the engineering of it made it a, a, a very proper winery in its day. The um, probably was used the most in, in the time of Kanai Nagasawa, the Japanese who owned the ranch after Thomas Lake Harris left. Nagasawa was Harris' disciple while Harris was here. There's really no evidence that he was much of a Harris disciple once Harris was gone. He um, lived here and operated the winery from 1891 when Harris left until 1934 when he died. He wanted desperately, Nagasawa did, for his nephews, nieces, to inherit the property, but it didn't work out that way. The um, um, the next owner, the next winery owner, was a man named Errol McBoyle from Grass Valley, a gold miner who came here and, and did run the winery for a while, and later died, and it was his wife's, his widow's second husband, Beckhold, who, who did the, the disaster to the grapes. He wanted to be a cowboy, and he wanted to run beef cattle on Fountain Grove. Good. Okay, we're on. All right. Thomas Lake Harris was here just 16 years in all. Uh, he came in 1875, and he left in 1891 with a cloud of scandal hanging over his head. Uh, the scandal was was um, short-lived. He most of his 16 years here were he was uh, a very respected member of the Santa Rosa community. He seemed to operate very successfully at the um, social level and was a member of the. Masonic Lodge and entertained the Knights Templars here at, at luncheons and was a, a guest speaker very often at some of the Mason's doings. He um, um, came in 75, as I said, from New York and built the Manor House, which is now gone. It was down at the foot of the hill from where we're, we are now. And uh, two other residential buildings, one the Commandery, which was for the men, and another for the women, which he called the familstery, was later called the cottage. The winery was not the first industry at Fountain Grove, although it was the reason that, that Harris came here. He came, he had, he had made wine in New York and was very interested in viticulture. And um, evidence is that it was probably the fact that in 1875, this region was opening up as grape growing area that brought Harris to Sonoma County. Um, Nagasawa said in his diaries, Kanai Nagasawa said that that Harris read an ad in a, in a viticulture magazine that described what a good grape growing region this was and decided at that time to come to Sonoma County. He came, um, they, when he first came, the members of the Brotherhood of the New Life who came with him sold uh, eggs and butter and made brooms, which they peddled in, to the townspeople. And with the money that came from that, they began to plant grapevines and, and eventually built the winery. The first winery, uh, burned in 1891. This building was constructed, or I beg your pardon, in 1892. Uh, this building was constructed, construction was begun immediately on, on the new winery. Now, now we're, we're looking at... The blacksmith shop? Yeah, we're looking okay. right down the lane. All right. What, the building, the, the tin building that we're looking at in the background is, is a um, more modern blacksmith shop than the one where Zeno, the blacksmith, plied his trade, which 
I believe from evidence was um, maybe um, 50 yards further this way on the, on the creek. The, um, this was just about the end of the industrial area of the Fountain Grove Ranch. The buildings beyond are new buildings that have been added since the 50s. They're, they're horse barns for the polo ponies that the present owner keeps here. Um, the winery at its peak, which was probably in the 18, from 1890 to about 1930, or to, to at least until pro Prohibition, um, operated um, what well, was one of the one of the, the leading wineries in California. The, they, they used a lot of Chinese labor, which is kind of interesting because uh, Japan and China have never, their relations, I guess, have never been politically the best. And, and it was interesting to note that in some of the pictures, some of the Japanese workers who worked for Nagasawa overseeing the young Chinese workers, which must have been a, a kind of an enviable position for young Japanese to be in in those times. The, um, um, the hills beyond that you see were all grapevines at one time. Go ahead, will you? Kingsley prompted Harris to, to, to design the silos at the end of the, of the, uh, the loading platform up there. It was round. Um, it gives, gave a lot of people a lot of misconceptions, particularly when Nagasawa saw fit to build the, the barn on the front of the property uh, in the same round shape. Um, farther north in Sonoma County is a place called Fort Ross, which is where the only Russian settlement in continental United States was. And the, the, uh, some of the Russian buildings are round, the guard, guard posts mainly. And it immediately gave people the impression that this, these were Russian in, in concept. I don't think there was any Russian involved. Um, all of the buildings at Fountain Grove were designed, according to Harris's own writings, to go to be taken to the celestial sphere physically come the millennium. They were all going to rise as were all the people. I don't know, rise or go wherever it was that they were going. Um, I think that the, the round was more of a whim than Russian. The, uh, uh, it did prompt Siegfried Beckhall, the man whom I sort of have made into the villain of the piece, I guess, because he took the vines out. But it did prompt him to put up a sign, which is down the road, which says, Russian barn built by Russian workmen. And this is, of course, nonsense. It was built by a man named Lindsay who lives down the road. And there was nothing Russian about it. Let's let's move. All right. My own involvement with Thomas Lake Harris started in about 1963, when I was working on a book of Sonoma County history, Sonoma County in the 19th century, called Wild Oats in Eden, and I became interested in the four utopian communities that were in Sonoma County and especially in Thomas Lake Harris because he was a unique sort of character and later on I was given um, a box of his books and his manuscripts and read them with interest, read his poetry with interest, not so much uh, as poetry but as for the uniqueness of it. It was a, it's, it's a very um, high-flown form that he used. I. Uh, at first I thought, you know, and what little I knew about Harris at the time, that his story would make a good novel. It would be good to do a piece of fiction based on his life. And of course, like most things, the more I learned about it, the more, the deeper I got five years than probably in the 30 or 40 years that preceded that, I guess because of the renewed interest in utopian communities in general, and people are, are interested, beginning to be, in, young people particularly, are beginning to be more interested in, in the experiments of the past. Certainly, Harris and his Brotherhood of the New Life was one of the nobler experiments. Um, he called himself a theo-socialist, a, a, a name that I have always, he was good at coining names for things. Um, if he couldn't find the right word in English, he'd make up his own language, his manor house down the road that's gone now. He called Astavosa, which he said meant high country of divine joy, but he never said in what language, which I think was... Uh, uh, typically obscure of him, difficult to explain in a few words. I think that I can boil the religion down to about three tenets, which would be oversimplification, but it's, it's a way of getting to it. He believed in a dual God. He believed in a male-female God, whom he called Jesus Yesa or Christus Christa. Um, he believed in a, in a celestial sphere where lived angels. Uh, 
in which everyone had a, a counterpart. Every earthly, earthly being had a counterpart in the celestial sphere. He didn't believe in earthly marriage. He believed that people should save themselves for their counterparts uh, in, in the next life. He um, himself was married to a spirit that he called Queen Lily of the Conjugal Angels. I always have a hard time saying that with a straight face. Um, in the celestial sphere, and she bore him two children in that sphere. Um, he, uh, to be a, a kind of, of form of yoga, he taught it to people. It was, it was necessary that his disciples should learn the gift of the breath, as he called it, before they could be initiated into the inner circle of the heavy. Uh, they did a lot of dancing, a lot of laughing. They had a poem on their plate every morning at breakfast. They added, when they added a room to the manor house, they added a ballroom with a spring floor. And a lot of his poems exhort um, uh, his disciples to laugh and to sing and to dance and be happy. There is no church at Fountain Grove. There was never a church or a chapel here. There was one. I think he probably was the first chapel of attention as such. He was, interestingly enough, um, at least according to my research, he was one of the first five or six Japanese in the United States. Nagasawa was one of a group of 12 young Japanese who were smuggled out of their home city of Kagoshima um, before the Meiji Restoration, which was before 1860 and at a time when no Western influences were allowed in Japan. They simply didn't want anything to do with the Western world. And the prince, or whatever the Japanese equivalent of a prince is, of, of the Satsuma clan, which Nagasawa was a member of, uh, had the foresight to see that his, the, the destiny of the Japanese and of his clan in particular would lie in, in, in the, their learning the ways of the West because he knew that it was inevitable. And he smuggled these dozen young men, his brightest young men of the clan, out of Japan at night. They left on a ship and they went to Yokohama, I believe, or maybe they went into to Singapore, that was it, after Yokohama. Fortune and both came to the United States to join him. He um, met Harris in England and at Oliphant's suggestion, a